Romans chapter 3. <laughs> always kind of hard to get back in in gear thinking about books it's been two weeks since we uh, since we were together so uh, we'll uh, we'll try to ease back into the to the book of Romans we'll take a look at as far as we can go from chapter three and four uh, tonight uh, uh, when we get there so let's remind ourselves a little bit of, of the theme of Romans and uh, kind of how the book is put together so what give me kind of the theme the overall thought of the book of Romans what is it about? Encourage the church. So it's a, it's encourage the church and encourage the church in what way? Specifically, what is going on in the church in Rome? Well, I guess. Okay, so yeah, there's some there's some idol worship that's going on that the that Paul's going to have to address. Who who are the two? There's two groups of folks that are kind of in conflict with each other. Who's that? Jews and, right, Jews and Gentiles. So Romans is like Galatians. It is a book to address kind of the Jew-Gentile uh, relationship. And the theme, the overall theme, so this is kind of one of those that we call a middle-of-the-night question. 20 years from now, if I come wake you up and go, what is the theme verse from the book of Romans? You will look at me in a groggly face and say, Romans chapter 1, verse 17, 18. Okay? For up. I am not ashamed of the gospel okay so it is uh the this is a book about the gospel 16 and 17. 16 and 17. Favorite, see i would have messed up my own middle of the night question but uh well, it's almost so, the middle of the night for you now anyway. yeah <laughs> true um so as you go through the book of romans it is a presentation of the gospel of christ going through so this first part is a discussion about Sin. It's a, it's a discussion about the separation that men have because of their sin. And Paul makes the point, and he's going to make it again here in chapter 3, that Jew and Gentile are alike in that. There's no difference between the two groups. They are both separated by sin, and they are both going to be redeemed by faith uh, through grace uh, in Jesus Christ. And so it doesn't matter. And that's, part of, that's part of Paul's discussion is that this whole Jew-Gentile thing is, is, shouldn't even be a, a discussion because uh, we are all, we're all the same. We're all in the same boat together. So he starts, of course, in chapter 1, and he really talks about, uh, about the sin problem, and they, they, all, they all have it in common. And so uh, he starts there in, in verse 18 of chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So whether you're Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. The wrath of God is coming. Verse 20, it doesn't matter uh, where you are. There are no excuses. God's creative power, his divine nature, eternal power have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made. So men are without excuse. He then goes into this this cyclic nature of sin. And as you start there in verse 21 and go through the end of, of chapter 1, the sin just, it, it just gets worse. And it's, it's like you're doing a spiral. You know, you're caught in a tornado and you're just, it just over and over. And the, and the longer it goes, the worse it gets. So by the time you get to the end of, of chapter 1, um, he says in verse verse 32, although they know the ordinances of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval of those who practice them. So he, he's, he's lumped everybody, Jew and Gentile in the world, into one, into one big mass. Chapter 2, verse 1, as he now addresses the church, he says, you, therefore, have no excuse. So as he begins in chapter 2, verse 1, he addresses the church, and... Uh, the church, unfortunately, is apparently behaving similar to the rest of the world. He said, you know, if, if you're going to call somebody a liar and you're doing the same thing, uh, you know, what, do you think that's okay? And, of course, the answer is no. As a matter of fact, they are blaspheming the name of God by their behavior. So uh, he gets on to them uh, about that. We get down to chapter 2, verse 17. He will then directly go... Uh, and directly address the Jews at that point. If you bear the name Jew 
and you rely on the law and you boast in God. So he is now addressing uh, the Jews and uh, so he kind of gets on to them again. Verse 24, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, because of their behavior. So uh, Jew and Gentile alike uh, have got some changes to make. One of, before we move into chapter 3, look at chapter 2, verse 28. Because chapter 2, verse 28 is kind of an intro to what he's going to discuss in chapter 3. He says, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And the praise is not from men, but from God. Now in chapter 3, he's going to discuss this. He's going to develop that concept when we get into chapter 3 as he talks about Abraham. Okay? Um, so actually, actually that may be, I guess that's chapter 4 uh, when we get to Abraham. But he's going to, he's going to develop that concept uh, quite a bit fuller in the next couple of chapters. All right. When we then move into chapter 3, and he's still talking to the Jews uh, that are there at, at the church in Rome. And there's a, there's a series of statements that Paul makes. And to be quite honest, some of these statements are rather confusing to me. And it, it looks like Paul is addressing arguments. And I just jotted this across the top. These are perhaps arguments that Paul has faced over the last 20 years in his ministry. So he's visited with Jews in various places. He's visited with church members. And I think they have maybe made these arguments to him. Because he's making, he's never been to Rome. So I think he's going, I bet here are some of the arguments they are making in their minds. I'm going to address them up front so that we, they can have an answer to some of these. So like I said, I think this is coming from his 20 years of experience uh, as, a, as a preacher and missionary. And so he's going to address them up front. So as I mentioned, it gets, it gets a little bit confusing in the text. Uh, and some of that I just don't know, and when I don't, I'll just tell you. I don't, I don't know what's going on here with some of this. All right, let's take a look first of all at verses 1 through 8 uh, with some of these arguments that Paul probably has heard that he, he wants to talk to the, to the church about. What then advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? So that's probably a, a question he's been asked. Okay, so if Jews and Gentiles are alike; they're all embraced under sin. Then, what, what's what's? Why be a Jew? Why do circumcision? Why do this old law stuff? So he's probably, like said, probably been asked that before. And Paul's answer in verse two says, "Well, it is great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the very oracles of God." So his first answer is fairly simple. What is this covenant that God made with Israel? Was it for nothing? And Paul's answer is no. The Jews were entrusted with the very words of God, with the very nature of God. Now, he's going to continue. What then? So this be maybe another argument that he'd been given. What then if some did not believe? Their unbelief doesn't nullify the faithfulness of God, does it? So what if there were some Jews, and in fact we have a whole list of them in the Old Testament, including the kings and, and prophets and all those people. What if they were rebellious against God? What if they were not faithful? Does that mean that God's chosen people nullified the goodness of God? Uh, he will say in verse 4, may it never be. May it never be. Rather, let God be found true and every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail, uh, and prevail when you are judged. If the unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? So, the, the Jews in the past had been unfaithful. They had been unrighteous. They had rebelled against God. That didn't say that God was unrighteous. That just made the contrast between the man and God even greater. And so that's kind of that's Paul's answer that it demonstrates the righteousness of God that through men's unrighteousness. <clears throat> so verse 5 then is kind of another question that might be asked. So if that is indeed the case, if man's unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, 
he will then continue verse 5 the God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous is he well God created them that way here they are being unrighteous and yet God's going to judge them for that and he says in parentheses I'm speaking in human terms so he's, this is an argument he's been told before verse 6 may it never be otherwise how will God judge the world but if through my life the truth of God abounded to his glory. Why am I also still being judged as a sinner? This is another argument that men have made. This kind of goes by, you know, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, he will say, shall I continue to sin that grace may increase? It's that argument, the same argument as this. If my sin demonstrates God's righteousness, shouldn't I sin? Shouldn't I lie more to demonstrate God's, uh, God's greatness? And... Um, Verse 8, he says, And why not say, as we are slanderously reported and some claim that we say, let us do evil, the good may come, uh, their condemnation is just. So Paul just kind of says that is just, that's crazy talk. Okay? They're, they're con if, if you're going to make that argument so that you can behave evil in evil, then your condemnation is just, Paul says. So... The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. If some did not believe God's message, then they're guilty. Okay? They're guilty. It, it didn't mean God was, was unjust. It meant those men were guilty, and they are going to face the wrath of God. So basically, verses 1 through 8, that's kind of, in my, in my understanding, a, a short capsule of verses 1 through 8. Okay? And again, it's, it's presented with these arguments that I think people have made to Paul. Well, Paul, what about this? Does, does this mean God is unjust? No. Does this mean I should sin more? No. Men will pay the price for men's sin. God is still the standard. And he, he's going to add some more to this in just a minute. All right, any comments, questions about verses 1 through 8? A lot of, lot of stuff going on in those few verses. A lot of stuff. All right, let's move down to verses 9 through 20. He gets into verse 9. What then? Are we better off than they? So, are the Jews better off? And Paul's going to say, not at all. It, it doesn't make one better or worse. Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jew and Greek were all under sin. And then, starting in verse 10, he's going to quote from the Psalms, uh, several different Psalms he'll quote from here. Ver, uh, 310, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, there is none who seek for God. All have turned aside, together they have become useless. There is none who does good, there is not even one. Their throat is an open grave, with their tongue they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are their path. The path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So he's quoting from, uh, from Psalm 14, Psalm 53, Psalm 5, Psalm 140, Psalm 10. Uh, and then he's uh, quoting from Isaiah 59. Um, so he's grabbing a whole bunch of verses here. And he's just, he just kind of right. he's remembering those verses. As, as the writers uh, describe the, the kind of evil behavior of mankind. And then verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. But through the law, comes the knowledge of sin. So after Paul does all of that discussion, and he's saying Jews and Gentiles are alike, we're all sinners, we've all rebelled against God, yeah, the, the, Jews, the Jews had the very oracles of God, they didn't do a very good job transmitting them. But that, that changes nothing. God still entrusted them with the oracles of God. <clears throat> the law was given in order to communicate to mankind who God is. But the law had a shortcoming, and it wasn't that God made a mistake. The shortcoming was that the law did not have a method, did not have a procedure to justify men. 
There was nothing in the law to bring about true forgiveness of sin. So what all the law did, and that's what Paul says in verse 20, all the law did was bring about the knowledge of sin. That was its purpose. Okay? So, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, so I'm gonna, I've got a couple statements I want to make here in just a minute. All right, so notice my little jibber-jabber I wrote underneath verse 9 through 20. Aren't the Jews better than the Gentiles? No, for all have sinned. The law could just find no one. It just taught us about sin. That's all the law did. It could not justify anybody. Now, in verses 21 through 31, I'm gonna, I want to come back. I want to go to the, to the bottom first. The, the stuff in, in yellow there at the bottom. The law had no mechanism that brought forgiveness or would bring salvation. That wasn't the purpose of the law. The purpose was to communicate to mankind, here is the character of God. Here's how God wants you to behave. That's it. If you don't behave this way, it's a violation of who God is. But we needed that information. Okay? Um, when, when I taught school, one of the most important things for me to do with my students was to communicate to them, here, here is what is expected of you. Okay? If I catch you cheating on a test, I will pick your test up and you will get a zero and you get no chance of a retest. Okay, so don't cheat in my class. Because if you do, here are the consequences. My students need to know that information. Okay, that's what God has done. A loving, kind God communicated to us his nature through the old law. Now, the law simply tells us that we need help. So what is the law actually screaming out at us? What is the law screaming at us? You so let's say we're Jews. What does the law scream? You need, you're guilty. You need You're guilty. You need help. Yeah. You need help. That's what the law says. And guess what? Help came. Matter of fact, through the prophets, over and over again in the Old Testament, we, we look at the Messianic prophecies. Over and over again, forgiveness is coming. Forgiveness is coming. Y'all hold on. Forgiveness is coming. They try to live up to the law. They can't do it. And so faith is established. Faith established the truth that the law was saying all along. So when we put our faith in Christ, what we are saying is the oracles of God in the Old Testament were absolutely correct. Because I'm a sinner, I can't live like that. And I need help. And my help comes through Jesus Christ. I will put my faith and confidence in him because the law projected that. Now, anybody remember Galatians chapter 3? I think it's Galatians 3.27. Remember what it says about the law? What was the law? Galatians 3.27. It was a schoolmaster. It was a tutor to do what? To bring us to Christ. To bring us to Christ. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here in chapter 3. The law was just a tutor to tell us we need help. So the law can't bring salvation. So here are these Jews thinking that they need to be keeping the law because through these works of the law, they're going to get salvation. And Paul's going, no, it's not works that's going to bring you salvation. It's faith in Jesus Christ. All that law does is communicate that you're a, that you're a sinner. That was its purpose. Okay? Now, let's go back to, or let me stop right there, and then we're going to look at 21 uh, to the end of the chapter. Any comments about that little rampage? Yep. Did, did they even know about heaven and hell in the, in the old law? In the bulk of the old law? Because I never read, it always talks about going into, what's it called? It? Well, you know, it talks that David will talk about, you know, in the depths of Sheol and those those kinds of things. There was a concept there, but I tell you, who talked more about hell than any other writer of the Bible was Jesus. Uh, we learn more about our eternal, the eternal part of that from Him uh, than we do anywhere else. Uh, does anybody want to add to that? Because that's a great question, by the way. Isaiah. Is the only place I've ever seen where it actually talks about heaven 
the eternal heaven, not, yeah. not the heaven of yeah. God. Now, and there are some of these visions that the prophets will have, and they talk about going into, we talked about the word the heavenlies. <coughs> so they, they kind of will have these, these strange visions about their things. Daniel will have some visions in the heavenlies. So, you know, how much they understood about that, I don't know. I just really. wonder what that, like when they were teaching the Ten Commandments, and if they broke the law, did they just have the feeling that I'm going against God not that I'm going to go to hell or not be able yeah. to go to hell. As a matter of fact, I think what happened to most of them, of course, when they violated one of those commandments, <coughs> then they had to bring a sacrifice. That brought an animal. So if I violated something, it's going to cost me a sheep. That was probably that was probably more the, you know, than feeling actually guilty I violated God. So they stumbled over the, that was one of those stumbling stones they stumbled over, I think. They, did, they, they, they never got it. I don't know that they put together this concept of a sacrifice that that was a, you know, imagery of the Messiah paying for sin. I'm thinking they're going, oh, I lost a lamb today. So I think that was more Jesus their attitude. Kind yeah. of brought the whole idea. Right. When he came. He then introduced those people to eternity. And I, I, I believe that's. I believe that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, they were taught. Severe punishment when they sometimes that's right. them did and they killed them. That's right. And that should have been a pretty strong lesson to the others, whether they got the concept or not. Right. They knew they'd broken the law. Right. And and much more of the punishment in the Old Testament was a physical type of punishment, like Charles said. That's exactly right. And a lot of times it's death. <laughs> so I uh, think you know that's that's pretty severe punishment. But again, they may have more more have can't spit that well they may have been more afraid of death than they were violating God and, you know today you know when I sin I'm affected by how I have affected my God and you know, I think that's I think that's what God has wanted all along it just and then God's uh, the salvation of Christ or God went back to those people sure I mean is that how it teaches what happened to people prior to <clears throat> That's right. So all you know, I mean, obviously there were there were good people there that got things, that understood things, that did their best to try to live. Uh, they would be justified just like Abraham, who we'll look at in chapter four. Uh, you know, justified by his faith and by his actions, and the people were too. They weren't justified by their works, but they were justified by their faith in God, and then by obviously their their actions I, as well. Yeah, Mike. I don't know where it came from, but the Jewish people had to have some concept of the afterlife. Yeah. Because otherwise there wouldn't have been a, a philosophical argument between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Right. So some somebody had to have believed and taught about life after death. Sheol, as I understand it, is more like the the realm of the dead, right. where they are alive but not present in, in the world in which we live. Yeah, and um, and it's interesting so, that the entire sect of the Sadducees, you know, they did not believe. They almost didn't believe in the spiritual realm. They didn't believe in angels, and they didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. So, and again, we ask. How could that happen? Well, you look in the Old Testament, there's not that much. I mean, yeah. so and it's a great question, and there's just some things there we don't, you know, we don't just don't have answers. I don't have any answers to some of those things. Uh, great, great thoughts there. Why did, some places have talked about the fact, though, that God put eternity. That's right. Like a knowledge, a knowledge of eternity yeah. within man. Yeah. Ecclesiastes 3. That's right. But as far as the teaching goes, yeah. yeah. So other other than that, and that's perhaps where like the, the Pharisees, you know, they developed a lot of that was just from this internal, you know. And they seem to understand the bosom of Abraham. Yeah. So Yeah, to, to a certain extent metaphor. they did, right. So they had they had some of those ideas. Well, can we say listening to you as, as you caught these first three chapters, we're about to finish the third one. 
that we're lost. We're saved. <laughs> That's right. We're lost. And there is no hope except That's right. what's about to take place. That's right. Amen. And that's the whole purpose of the first part of Romans. I got you. Okay. You, you, got, you, got, you guys are, you know, We're in sin. All men sin. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we could say how much how much sin is going to be in heaven? Mm -hmm. None. That's right. Not even one. That's right. We're doomed. That's right. Except. Yeah. yeah. June, June Gentile alike. It's, and again, our, all this conversation here doesn't matter. Uh, if you're human, then you qualify <laughs> for, for what's going on. All right, let's jump into verse 21 then, go uh, 21 to the to the end here. So Paul is going to kind of, you know, we, I mentioned before that, especially in the book of Romans, Paul, it, it's like, I'm not real sure how to describe this, but it, it's like you're you're on a, you know, on a stove and uh, you're, you're, you're in a pot of water and in, in chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul has got the heat up about as, hard, as hot as it'll go. He's, he's got you rolling in, in the boiling water. And he's going to come, he's going to give us a little bit of relief now. Because he's going to begin to talk about how righteousness can now come. And especially when we get into chapter 4 and he gets to talking about Abraham, uh, there's, man, there's a beautiful parallel there that he's fixing to get to when we get into chapter 4. So he, he's going to kind of pull off in verse 21 and following. He's pulling this back just a little bit. And he's going to start talking about the righteousness of God. There is a righteousness of God out there for people. But it's not coming through the law. And that's, so far that's been his point. All right. So chapter 3, verse 21. But now, so you can feel the change there. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets forecasted it. They witnessed it. And here the righteousness of, of God has now come. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. So you hear that? he's taking us off the fire now. Because yes, we're all, we all share the sin problem of, of humanity. Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. We've all sinned and fallen short of, the God, of God's glory. But now we all can participate in his righteousness as well. There's no distinction. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So all can now partake of the righteousness of God. Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And again, I want to emphasize the point and ask the question, where is the redemption? In Christ Jesus. Okay? So... Uh, again, those words matter. Okay? It is only in Christ Jesus where the redemption lies. Uh, verse 25. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in, through his blood, through faith, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. So this is kind of what Russell asked about the Old Testament. The, the, the sin of the Old Testament was basically overlooked. We, we, I remember growing up, and you've heard me gripe about this before, I suppose, but when I was growing up, I was taught that, that when, when the Day of Atonement came and they did all the sacrifice, you know, the stuff with the high priest and all that stuff, and that's Leviticus uh, 16 or 16, I think, 16 or 17, that the sin problem was rolled forward. Okay, I've heard that, and I've probably said that before. But the sin problem wasn't rolled forward. It, you were just reminded. That's, that's what that sacrifice was all about. Okay? It was a preview. Forgiveness is coming, but forgiveness can't come. Okay? For, while you're alive, it can't come. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Forgiveness can't come until Jesus is sacrificed. At that point... Those who have lived through faith, that blood will flow backwards. So it will be credited to, credited to us. And we went too long ago, we talked about the mercy seat uh, on, the, on the altar. Uh, and here again, we have the propitiation. That's the word for mercy seat in the Old Testament. So Paul is making a direct reference to where the blood was placed on the Day of Atonement. 
here in Romans chapter three. Okay, because that's that's what that's called. It's called the propitiation. That's where the that's where the blood was placed on the mercy seat on the on the top of the of the ark of the covenant. So he makes reference to that there in verse twenty five. <clears throat> God's patience. He passed over the sins that were previous commit uh, previously committed. For the demonstration, verse 26, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So because of the blood of Jesus that was shed, God, all of the things that he did in the Old Testament by proclaiming forgiveness, okay, and those are the words, we looked at that back when we did that study, he proclaimed forgiveness. But it didn't happen until the blood of Christ. And now Paul says, we now know God was just and he is the justifier through the blood that was shed of Jesus Christ. All of those sins that were done previously can now be forgiven. Okay? So he's, he's kind of wrapped all this. He tied up this big, uh, this big bow for us. And then verse 27, he says, where then is boasting? He goes back to the kind of the first part when we started. Are the Jews better off? Are the Jew, do the Jews have a reason to boast because they're Jews? Where's the boasting then? It's excluded. Why is it is excluded? <coughs> because of what Jesus did. It had nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with how good I am or how many works I keep. It doesn't matter how many Lord's Suppers I take, how many Sunday nights I make, how many Bible classes I teach. The only thing that matters as far as, we, as far as the covering of blood goes, is what Jesus Christ did. doesn't matter how many Sabbaths they kept. None of that. <laughs> Where is the boasting? It is totally excluded. Totally excluded, he says in verse 27. By what kind of law? A law of works? No, but rather a law <laughs> of faith. So it, it re, there is a requirement of me. I must have faith. And my faith, and I uh, visited with Brett a little bit this morning about this, faith always includes courage, which includes an action on my part. There is no faith without an action on my part. Action is, uh, faith in the Greek is an action verb. It is something I do. It, has a, it, it changes me. Okay? Our, our world has this concept that belief and faith is something that only happens up here. Yes, it happens up here, but it can't be only up here because it's not faith if it's only here. Faith will every time lead to obedient action on my part. Every time. Otherwise, it is not faith. Okay? So, anyway, that, that confusion is just all over the world, and I think that confusion was happening in the church in Rome as well. All right, uh, back to verse 28. Um, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. All right, I, I need to do a little sidecar here. And y'all are y'all probably are familiar with this already. Here in Romans chapter 3, um, most of the time when Paul uses the word law, the definite article is not present. For example, in that verse right there, the definite article is not present. Man is not justified by works of law. Any legal system, doesn't matter what it is, any legal system cannot justify a human being. Okay? So there's a lot of people that want to read this and say this is only talking about the old law. It is not. That was never Paul's intention. Now, Occasionally, there, the definite article be there in the Greek. He's talking about the old. It does include the Old Testament law. But most of the time, he is talking about law. It, any legal system that man makes fits right there. No, but man is not justified by, by obeying any law. It is only through the blood of Jesus Christ and the faith that we put in it. Okay? So, anyway, we'll come back to that. It's, it's all over uh, this section in the book of Romans, 3, 4, 5, uh, up, through, uh, up through chapter 7. Uh, let's see. Where are we at? 
Uh, I got the side card there. Uh, that was verse 28. Okay. Uh, we maintain that man is justified by faith uh, apart from works of law. Is how that is how that reads. Is God the God of Jews only? Or is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, he's the God of Gentiles also. Since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised <coughs> through the same faith, that God is one. So again, it doesn't matter. Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. Since indeed God will justify the circumcised by faith and uncircumcised through faith is one, do we then nullify the law? So this is another one of those arguments I think men have made to Paul. Do we nullify, if, if, if we are saved by faith and not by works of law, did that nullify the law? Paul's answer to that is, no, on the contrary, we establish it. Now, my question is, how does that happen? How does faith establish law? I think right here he's saying, saying that the, it legitimizes the law as a teacher that's of, right. uh, of what's right and wrong and it helps us to learn about sin and how God wants that's us right. to What learn. did the law shout to us? You need help. So when we say, I've got to have faith, you know what I've done? I've established that what the law was trying to do, it accomplished. I've established law. Not, not done away with it. I've, I've established exactly what God wanted to do. God wanted me to understand, I'm a sinner. And I need the blood of his son. And once that happens, then the tutor that was to lead me to Christ was a tutor that led me to Christ. And I established the purpose for the law. And all of a sudden, God's amazing wisdom in placing the law in place all of a sudden makes sense to me. Because I can now see. You know what? Throughout these generations, God was preparing for the Messiah so that we could respond in such a way. Anyway, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Once we, get to, once we get to the end of this cycle uh, of all of this, uh, it's, one, it's again one of those things where I just kind of shake my head and go, that, we serve an awesome God. Uh, who, who could have ever come up with that? And we talk about the stumbling stones that were in the old law, and trying to be justified by works is one of those stumbling stones. And that the Jews were, were guilty of that. They wanted to obey the law, keep every dot and you know every little piece of the law, because they thought that's where justification came from. And it was doing them no good. Because they weren't going to keep it perfectly. And the blood of Christ is the only thing that can that can provide that. And God was trying to illustrate that with the mercy seat, the propitiation that was provided through the blood. Of the, on the Day of Atonement. So God was shouting out to the people. Here's what you need. is blood to be applied. Anyway, it's a beautiful cycle that comes together right there. All right, let me stop right there. Any, uh, any other comments about any of that? Yeah, uh, yeah Brett. One of my uh, professors of Oklahoma Christian, Raymond Kelsey, said, that, why did Jesus come to die and he said Romans 3.26 is the only verse that answers that is so that God could be just and God could justify those who have faith in Christ Jesus. So <coughs> That's right. where is the boasting? It's excluded because God sending Jesus makes him just and he is the one that does the justifying, makes us right with him. So he's the just one and he makes us right. Why did Jesus come to die? So God can be just and the one who can make us just in his presence. That's right. And so uh, that's, a, that's a great thing. It, it is. It's a it's beautiful, beautiful entry. Ms. Kate. Okay. Talk about the, the Gentiles. How, how were they justified before? Previous? Well, I think, I think Paul addresses that in chapter 1, verse 20. Men are without excuse. Because what is known about God was evident within them. So I, I, they would have been justified by their faith, just like the Jews were. They were never under a law, so they, they're not keeping any of that stuff. They don't have to do sacrifices. But what they know about God, they could have faith in God, 
and be justified based on that faith. And of course, God is going to be the the judge of all that. We don't know. We don't have the details. Well, we still have Gentiles. We still have to deal with the fact that all men, even those living under the world law, sin. That's right. And so there has to be an answer for that. Yeah. And Jesus is that only answer. That's exactly regardless of where they are. That's right. And they may be the greatest people in the world and believe that there is a God. Yeah. But they sin. That's right. And again, the blood of Christ is the only thing as it flows backwards. And God will decide of the Gentiles back during the Old Testament period that lived by faith, by what they knew. And God, God will, God is just, as Brett mentioned, and the justifier of them. We just don't know who they are. But God does. So, But it will be, they'll be saved just like Everybody else wasn't just like we are. Saved by our faith through the blood of Jesus Christ. Naaman the leper was a Gentile when he had faith. And that God That's true. Accomplished something in his life. Yeah. So, yeah, there's several examples. But that's a good one. Who will be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? I, I missed what you said there. Well, those that, those that have those that have faith that live accordingly in the back in the Old Testament, they will be oh, saved. The Old Testament. Okay, yeah. Okay. I understand that. I yeah, they will be saved. Just like we are, they would be saved by their faith through the blood of Jesus as it flows. Saved by those that have never heard the gospel. Right. Okay, I got you. All right. Any other comments? We only got about two minutes left. I hate to jump into chapter four. So between now and next week, read through chapter four and maybe read it, you know, a, a few times. <coughs> Again, a lot of uh, kind of some heavy stuff in chapter four. There's two examples in chapter four about this whole concept of. Uh, circumcision, when circumcision, when did the old law come in? Um, how was Abraham justified before God? And when was Abraham justified before God? Okay, so Paul's going to deal with that in chapter 4. So read through there and try to put some of those things. And do a little bit of reading back in the Old Testament. Go to back to Genesis 15. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. And maybe chapter Genesis oh, 16, 17 in there. Uh, and look at that section where it says uh, talks about uh, Abraham uh, believing God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. Okay, so that's where that's what Paul is centering in in chapter four is the righteousness of God given to Abraham because of his faith. So anyway, all right, we will end uh, right there and. Um, <coughs> hey, Brett. I know you're playing with the kiddo there. You, you want to lead us in closing prayer real quick? Thank you, Lord, for uh, letting us see the importance uh, of our need for Jesus. Father, we uh, just give you all the glory and praise and honor uh, for what you've done and are doing in our lives. Thank you again for uh, allowing us to be um, justified in your sight because of Jesus' glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.